Extraordinary. Philip Lowe suspends reality. Hello, it's Martin North and John Adams in the interests of the people. Hello, John. Hello, sir. Now, we've just listened to a very interesting speech from our beloved governor. Indeed. Philip Lowe today gave a speech at the National Press Club uh, he did in Sydney. Uh, one of the most extraordinary speeches I I've heard in recent times. I literally was watching at home, sitting on the couch. I fell off my chair like four or five times in the speech. And, and I just said to myself, this guy can't believe what he's saying. It is the most extraordinary um, propaganda I have ever heard an economic official say, and he said it with a straight face. And the journalist didn't ask him any tough questions. And, and we're going to go through some of the bold faced claims he made and whether they stack up to reality. Because either, um, uh, either you and I, and what we've been doing for the last uh, nine months, is just complete fantasy, or, 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 or he is either lying or he's, he's in his own bubble world, fantasy world. <laughs> or at least his models need resetting, right? Because his economic models and my economic models can't both be right. Exactly. Right? They're, they're pulling in completely different directions. And I'm looking at the data that's coming out from all the various sources, not just my own, and thinking, well, that's what I see. And he's got models and he's got data and he sees something completely different. It's like, who's in Alice in Wonderland? Somebody is. Exactly. After today, there is no middle ground. I mean, I mean, it's either we're crazy or, or he's just he's just full of crap. I mean, I mean, because the stuff he said today was just off the Richter scale. Oh, my God, I can't believe he just said that. OK, this is the first time that there's been a, a governor talking economic stuff. I have to say also, and I agree with you, I was very unimpressed with the quality of the questions after his speech. Yes, it's like everybody just sort of seems to bow down and worship what he says. So we're not going to do that, are we? No, no. But, but it, it goes to this issue of the establishment. Establishment bankers, establishment politicians, establishment bureaucrats, establishment journalists, they're all there protecting a whole bunch of vested interests. No tough questions. Why? Again, this is the fun, this is one, of my, one of the most fundamental questions for 2019. Why is some of these people in the financial establishment untouchable? And that's what I saw today. Um, no, you know, no one laid a glove on the guy and there's enormous scope for really tough questions to, 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 to ask him, and none of it was done today. And by the way, the Aussie dollar dropped afterwards. Right. So it's dropped by nearly a percent. Well, well, yeah, so I mean, I think any rational investor would lose confidence after listening to the, the, the extraordinary statements that the governor made today. Okay, well, let's go through some of the uh, headline news, as it were, shall we? Yes, yes. So, 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 so there's a number of statements that the governor made that, that I thought, we, let's just recap, and, and I just found it extraordinary. The first one is about house prices, uh, because, because it goes to the central thesis of what you and I have been saying. Uh, we have been saying that, to, in a large part, the house price bubble is driven by a house debt bubble. Um, and this has been a function of um, extraordinarily low interest rates um, uh, that, that's gone from 15% in 1990, uh, official cash rate, down to 1.5%. So it's gone down in one direction for 28 years. We've had very lax uh, um, in terms of lending standards. We've had sort of a whole host of criminal and misconduct issues in the banks in terms of uh, in terms of giving out mortgages, which the Royal Commission sort of picked up, um, so th there's a whole range of reasons why. Um, but obviously, in terms of generous tax incentives uh, and f grants and cash incentives like first homeowners grants, etc., there's been a number of, of extraordinary policy levers that have led to this extraordinary build-up of debt in the economy. That's the main factor for why house prices have gone up to the extent that it has because of credit, because of debt, because of the monetary system. What did he say today? He said house prices went up because there was a rapid increase in population and the building industry didn't respond in time to the increase in population um, and the delay of increase in supply and responding into population was, okay, so more people, not enough houses, prices goes up. Goes up. That's the reason for why prices have gone up um, nothing to do with interest rates, nothing to do with the RBA, nothing to do with his decisions or APRA or, or, or in terms of the approach of the banks. And, you know, 
you know, this is the same sort of propaganda that was pushed in Ireland before the housing price crisis. Immigration, population, house supply. I've heard this script all before. Um, they say this every time before it blows up. And he said it again to again again today. I mean, when I've done my analysis for the for, for News Limited and other publications, which data was I using? I was using his own data. I was using the ABS. I'm not like I mean, you've got your own independent data set, but largely for me, I've been using the government's own data to show the extraordinary buildup of debt. And he basically says that doesn't exist. Extraordinary statement. Mm. Yep. Well, we know that it's credit creation that is driving the whole thing. Credit creation drives home prices. The um, credit impulse, in other words, the rate of change of credit growth, if it goes hot positive, it drives prices up. If it goes negative, it drives prices down. To isolate that and say it's not part of the problem is remarkable. Absolutely, yep. absolutely. So, so that, that, that was the first thing he said. But again, just, just on this point for one second, um, when, when the Reserve Bank in 2008 cut interest rates to 3% because of the GFC, um, the, you know, it wasn't Philip Lowe then, it was the former governor. Um, he said this is an, an emergency low. Well, the most obvious question to ask the RBA governor in a public forum is, at 3% it was an emergency low. We're half of the emergency low. What, you know, should, I mean, this level of interest rates is not normal. It's an abnormal level. And yet today he, he opened the door for interest rates to go even lower, um, depending on, on what he calls about these downside risks. Well, um, you know, why isn't he questioned to say, well, if an emergency level was 3%, what do you describe 1.5%? And how can you uh, uh, sustain or how can you argue that this is um, uh, normal policy uh, when, when you look at the history of, um, of interest rates going back? You don't have to go back just 20 years. Go back three, four centuries. I mean, I, mean, I, mean, I think Alan, uh, Alan Greenspan said that over two or three centuries, the average interest rate is around between five to six to seven percent um, over centuries. Well, you know, I mean, this level of interest rates is not normal. And yet no financial journalist at the press club asked the most obvious question. And I want to I want to understand why. Why did why did they let him off? Yep, I agree. It's really, really, really weird. We are in an abnormal situation. And yet now he's signaling potentially rates will go even lower. Exactly, exactly. So, 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 so in, in terms of um, in terms of the Royal Commission, so, so there was a couple of extraordinary statements he made. He said the issue, the central issue was the bank managers and not the regulators. So ASIC and APRA, he said, they are extra, they're very good regulators according to international standards um, um, and nothing to, do, nothing to see here. It's all about the banks. Well, why did the, why did the banks break the rules? Because ASIC and APRA have been ineffective in their roles. Um, they, they, particularly APRA, they are captured organizations because they are staffed by the Bankers Club insiders. And yet he said nothing to see with the regulators. Well, I mean, again, I mean, how, how can that argument be sustained? Because you know, if you look at the interim report, but also the final report by Commissioner Hain, I mean, I mean, I mean this issue of um, a lack of compliance with the rules and the lack of regulatory enforcement, it was a consistent theme. Well, who's responsible for that? It's APRA and ASIC. And he says, well, they, they, they're, they're like close to world best standard. I mean, an extraordinary statement. Mm -hmm. How can that, I mean, I mean again, I mean, what is this guy, what is this guy smoking? <laughs> and remember, of course, that the Council of Financial Regulators, which is the peak body, right, that includes ASIC and APRA and RBA and Treasury, right? Who chairs that? It's the Reserve Bank. Yeah. So effectively, he's in the middle of this, which is perhaps one reason why he's saying nothing to see here move on. Precisely, precisely. Um, and we're going to do a video about the Royal Commission report exclusively. But, 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 but yeah, he, he said another extraordinary statement was um, the, the recommendations by the commissioner were, was well balanced. We need a reform and not a revolution. Well, I mean, I mean, the, I, mean I, I thought the Royal Commission report was a complete whitewash. Uh, from, from a macroeconomic perspective, the, the Royal Commission report changes nothing in terms of the debt bubble, in terms of the further buildup of debt. Um, I mean, look, it, it's all still going to continue the way it's been continuing, but slightly in a different form. Um, and again, I mean, I mean, if you're really going to um, address these, um, the, these systemic structural malices of the economy, we did need a revolution. The report didn't, didn't deliver that. And yet he says 
great rapport, great, great recommendations, even though people who are, I mean, I mean so you and I, people could say we're in the non-mainstream. There's a whole bunch of mainstream analysts, commentators, who, who said that the report, you know, was, was a complete joke. So, so for him to say it was a fantastic report, again, another extraordinary statement. I, I, mean, I just, again, nearly fell off my chair when he said, when he said that. Yeah, well, we'll cover the uh, commission, I guess, report in more detail. But I agree with you. It failed to address the critical issues that needed to be addressed and, in fact, fiddled around the edge at things which were important but not critical, is how I read it. Yes, yes. So, so, so another thing that... So at the beginning of the speech... So, so again, parliamentarian tells me last year they know they stuffed it up. They're looking for plausible deniability... So how does he start off his speech? He goes, we're going to talk about the international economy. We're going to talk about downside risks. Those downside risks are building up. So, so he actually outlined four different things, John, didn't he, that effectively were driving the international situation, but they're all political. Yes, yes. So, so, so he outlined four, four elements around, around uh, these downside risks, and they were all political. In, in terms of Brexit, in terms of the US-China trade dispute, in terms of the increase of populism, increase of what he would declaw, call the decline in the, in the support for the, for, the, for, the, for the global liberal order, uh, basically um, in a criticism of Trump's nationalism. These, these are the factors that are, could, could cause some sort of global economic um, disruption. I mean, but, but what's the elephant in the room? Global debt is at least $85 trillion more than 2007. Global debt is in excess of $250 trillion, a quarter of a quadrillion dollars. Um, that, that, that's the central issue at play, and that didn't even, I mean, that didn't even come up. There are no economic factors that, that could be leading to any downside risk. I mean, again, I mean, I, mean, I mean, this is just fantasy economics. How can, this is the elephant in the room and goes, well, it doesn't exist. Could some of these political factors um, cause a, a, a global meltdown? I don't think, look, to be honest, I don't think so. It really is, is the debt and the sustainability of the debt. I mean, I mean like, you know, whether at the domestic level or, the, or at the global level, th that, that is the central concern or should be the concern for policymakers. And, and yet he basically says, if you don't support the, 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 the BIS globalist uh, Davos uh, World Economic Forum um, club, well, well, that's going to blow it up. I mean, I, mean, I mean, this is just nonsense. And that echoes earlier comments from the Reserve Bank that they're not sure how much debt is, you know, too much debt, right? Yes. It doesn't seem to me that they think that debt's a real problem at all. Yes, well, I mean, look, yeah, so the Deputy Governor in, in, in his speech uh, in December said, well, we don't know um, what, uh, it, like, what, uh, what it means to have excessive debt. Well, I mean, I mean again, the, the, the former Deputy RBA Governor in September of 2007 said at that point, the level of debt in the economy was more than the 1890s and the 1920s before two depressions we had in this uh, we had in Australian history. This amount of debt is unprecedented since the arrival of the first fleet, and yet um, it, it is as if it doesn't exist. I mean, he has suspended reality uh, in terms of this speech. And, and, and the final point I, you know, I thought I'd make is, he talked about the budget uh, in terms of, of fiscal uh, fiscal sustainability, and he said it's important to um, it's important to balance the budget to get it into surplus uh, and to get the federal government's fiscal house in order because we are going to need a fiscal response when something goes bad. He said, "Yeah, you know, economies do have downturns. We need to have a fiscal response." Keynesianism. Um, so, so, so you know, how big is the stimulus package going to be this time? A hundred billion, two hundred billion, three hundred billion. I mean, how? I mean, I've got a kid who's four years old. How much debt does Philip Lowe want to settle my daughter with um, that that she will have to handle um, over the next forty or fifty years? I mean, again, I, I mean, th this is a legitimate question for young people, for children who are growing up in this country. You've got a governor who's saying, "I'm going to drown you in debt. I'm going to ruin your lives, uh, and you're going to be, um, you'll have to work in, in effectively debt slavery for the next sixty, seventy years." to pay off all of this debt that I want to settle you guys with. I mean, how is that, how is that you know, how, where is the economic justice in that? Yeah, so it seems to me that if I sort of stand back, two points. The first point is 
he's not going to do anything until things get really, really bad, right? So there's no preemptive positioning. There's no recognition that actually we need to take some steps now to sort of turn off some of those debt-related issues, right? That's right. And secondly, he won't do anything until it's gone bad, and then they'll just throw money at it, either printing money or you know raising the debt level further. So it's just continuing the cycle further. So there's no intent or even the intelligence to think differently about the problem. We're just rep repeating again the old recipe. Well, according to what he was saying today is th there is no problem. Yeah. I mean, you are, you and I are just, I mean, he's probably thinking well, we're crazy. I mean, I mean, there was someone in the audience, uh, Peter Switzer, he, he talked about being trolled by Bush economists. Well, who's trolling him on Twitter? I'm one of those people. He, you know, Switzer called me a Bush economist today, and like, you know, I'll, I'll wear that with a badge of honor because in the annals of economic history, um, we've never had a debt. I, I continue to say this to, to people who are detractors: show me a time in, in world economic history when you've had a debt bubble this big that has not resulted in a catastrophic economic event. You show me that a case study, I'll keep my mouth shut. The reality is that case study does not exist. And yet he has suspended, re suspended reality today and, 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 and by consequence has implied that you and I are just completely crazy nuts. Yep. Reality is on the blink, John. Reality is on the blink. Thank you very much. Martin North, John Adams, for the interests of the people.